that Dave normally do that? <coughs> oh, okay. Well, Tom, <laughs> since you spoke up, pray for us, please. Thank you, Brother Tom. Yes, do remember, Brother Dave, he is traveling. He'll be in Florida. Uh, I'm not sure when he's coming back, but he's no, down there. Tomorrow. tomorrow? Okay. So uh, you know how fun it is to fly recently, and, you know, pray you don't have a crazy person on your flight that uh, disrupts your flight or something. So pray for Dave as he's down there with his brother and uh, his time there and his time coming back. So let's continue singing hymn number 245, hymn 245 at Calvary. <laughs> sing all four verses and if you didn't sing the third verse you'd miss that now I've given to Jesus everything it doesn't make much sense there if you don't give your life to Jesus you kind of miss out on a big part of it there hymn number 249 as we continue Jesus paid it all
607. Hymn number 607, what a day that will be. Jesus, draw me close. Him 553. Let's we'll stand together as we sing. Get some blood flow to your legs. Tell it to play Jesus, draw me close. you tonight um, as we draw into your presence as we lift praise to your name father we ask that um, you will be among us father uh, that we will know you um, through your word tonight father that as you speak and as you have spoken for uh, generations that you will continue to speak to your people father you will challenge us through your word you'll bring us to a point of surrender to you that we will we will come before you offering all that we have. Father, all the, the filthy rags that we have, Father, we offer them up to you to glorify your name and, Father, to honor you in all we do. We ask that you'll bless Brother RJ. Father, we thank you, Father, for uh, the leadership that he provides. Uh, the Father, the, the fact that you uh, are able to speak through him, to, to channel your word through him, to uh, lead us, to direct us, to allow us to 
see the beautiful things that are in your word. We ask that you'll guide and direct in all things and ask in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. Well, let's do something a little different tonight. Every once in a while, I like to throw everybody off. So let's do prayer list first. Does that throw everybody off? It does, doesn't it? It just makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I have some power or something. I don't know. Who all needs a, a prayer list? Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Cliff. I have a special pet name for Cliff I won't share with you tonight, though. All right. Prayer list. Here we go. So Sister Vanessa's dad is still in the hospital. Uh, he is, in some areas, doing better. His, uh, he's down to just 1.1 liters of oxygen, so uh, that, that's a plus. They moved him out of ICU. That's a plus. But they moved him to a, a place where his wife can't see him, so that's obviously a negative. And so she drove an hour this morning to, to be with her husband, as she has been for the last week. Um, and was told that she can't see him. So um, that's a bad deal. So be praying specifically that they would move him to a place in the hospital where uh, Vanessa's mom could actually see him again. Um, so that would be the, the current prayer. Right now, again, he is getting better as far as less, uh, less oxygen needs, but he is getting, um, he's still very weak, still trying to get over all of that. Um, so anyways, be praying for Vanessa's uh, father. Sister Kay uh, Palmiter, her, her sister, Barbara Farley, is out of the hospital, was out, got out yesterday. She, uh, she is back into her nursing home, still weak, and she still, uh, still has, uh, she's still positive for COVID, so they have her quarantined in the nursing home uh, for the foreseeable future. Brother Dave, as we've already mentioned, we're praying for him. Uh, he is in Florida, uh, flew out um, Monday at 4 o'clock. And so he's supposed to get in tomorrow, fly back tomorrow at some point. But his brother Ken is still in the hospital. He was home on hospice. That didn't work out so well. Uh, miscommunication, all kinds of, of errors happen there. Um, and so he will not be going back home on hospice. They're trying to find a, a care facility for him. Or the latest I, I heard is he may just end up staying there. He's um, now not doing dialysis, so he's declining dialysis at this point. So. Um, be praying for, for Dave and his brother Ken and uh, his, brother's, um, his brother's wife as well. Continue to lift up the Good News Club. As I know you guys are, we're still having around 20 kids at the Good News Club over at Horseman. So that is a, a, a huge blessing. We've seen lots of kids get saved over there. We've handed out tons of Bibles. So it's been, it's been a very effective ministry. So continue to pray for that. They will not meet this week. Uh, they have uh, teacher parent conferences over there this week, so they will not meet this week. But be praying or continue to pray for our Good News Club. Don and Don are missionaries from Brazil. They sent out an update today. I've not had a chance to read it. Has anybody had a chance to read that update they sent today? All right. Do you have, is it normal, kosher, anything you'd like to share? Or? Chicken co-op. Don and Don. Really? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Be praying for them. All right. And then obviously, uh, uh, Colby King and 330 Ministries continue to pray for them as well. Our nursing homes. Um, if you'll remember from Sunday, uh, Betty Voss, no, I'm sorry, Jean Voss and Shirley King both uh, have COVID. And they are um, obviously isolated at this point so be praying for those two as they recover from covid so far uh, recovering pretty well so that's good news continue to pray for them but uh, also pray for the keen family obviously jay with the passing of his father the shanaki family uh, with the passing of sister Catherine's niece linda uh, we're still praying for brother mike still praying for the dover family um, obviously uh, mary needham's mother and uh, mary needham as well david uh, david how's your how's your dad doing brother Awesome. All right. And how's Carol doing? Yeah. Yeah. She tired yet? Yeah. All right. Well, we're, I don't know about I don't know about you guys, but I'm praying for Carol just as much as I'm praying for your father. So 
continue to, to lift them up, brother. All right. Um, you guys can see the chronological 2022 and then the uh, women's Bible study. You can see all that. That's great. All right. Uh, spiritual needs, continue to pray for those. There's no change on those. Teresa Corsi uh, went into the hospital uh, Sunday evening, about 9 o'clock they left. She got home yesterday evening, so she was in a little over a day or two, uh, still struggling with congestive heart failure, still struggling. This time it was her potassium level was extremely high. So uh, be praying for her. Again, she is home. Um, Terry didn't know if he'd make it tonight or not. Obviously, it doesn't look like he did make it. So uh, be praying for their family. Uh, Brother Scott, Scott uh, has a lot of things going on with him. Uh, but he has a cracked vertebrae uh, they found. They're doing some uh, PT with him. He did start that on Monday. H how did that go, sister? It, it, it. Okay. All right. We'll be praying for him. Be praying for Scott and Nancy both. Uh, you know, they're looking at uh, maybe they have already signed the paperwork. I know they were, they did sign the paperwork. All right. Okay. All right. So they are they are selling their home and moving to the city. Um, so they, I assume, will, will no longer be a part of our congregation when that actually happens. But they're moving closer to her children or to their children. So, um, But be praying for them. A lot going on with them. And they need our prayers. They need to know that their church families praying for them um, so be lifting them up again that's uh, Scott and, and Nancy Neff uh, Shabon is this hypo, hypoglycemia you doing well brother uh, Ronald Burnett his his uh, medicine is not working so um, you know there was a spot where we thought it might be working and but it is absolutely not working so uh, be praying for that be praying for Ronald as we or as they address that situation be praying for Susan as she continues long suffering, and uh, you know we know that, that she has been for years, and um, she is a godsend to Ronald, and so we we thank you for that. Hey, I'm just saying some people are easy to live with, like me, and some are not, right? Huh? Just, huh? What? Come on! I'm not the one in prison all the time. <laughs> uh, Gerald. Gerald uh, was here on, on Sunday, so I don't know if you guys saw him or not. Gerald was here on Sunday. He is looking better, doing better, uh, but uh, now, so remember he had COVID. He had many strokes. He had an actual stroke, um, and now he is dealing with blood sugar um, decreasing drastically. So be praying for Brother Gerald. He's, he's had everything thrown at him lately. And then uh, on Monday, he had some, some things, uh, some skin tags and such burned off on, on Monday, so... Just be praying for Gerald. Again, there are a lot of different things going on with that. Don Stelter's brother, continue to pray for him. He is out of the hospital. He is doing better, um, but just not very well at all. Be praying while I'm thinking about this. Be praying for Brother Don. Uh, Don is actually starting a Wednesday night Bible study at his work. So tonight was the first night that they started that. So I haven't obviously haven't heard how that went. But if you think about it, be praying for uh, Brother Don as he started, again, a, a new Bible study for the people at his work. Be praying for Linda Rudd and her sister as well. A.J. and Don uh, Melendez's uh, friend, be praying for them. Uh, Lee Worth's uncle, Rusty, be praying for him as well. Sister Margaret Aiken um, had some bad news this week, had a PET scan, and uh, some things have grown, some things have gotten enlarged, and... Um, it, it's, it's not, uh, it wasn't the great news that, that they were wanting. And she said, uh, so a couple days ago, they said that they, she may have to start uh, taking chemo. But then the update today is she's going to wait and talk with her kids tomorrow, come up with a plan. So I don't know if Sister Kay's up there, but I think that's, that's where they're at right now. So sound about right? Wonderful. So be praying for that tomorrow, all right, for wisdom for all of them involved. Uh, Peter's pastor in California, her wife Susie, she was doing better last week. About the same? or That's all right. Keep praying. Brother Tommy, what's the latest on your daughter? No, nothing at all, huh? Drain tubes are out, no chemo pills, everything's... All right. Man, 
That is a praise, brother. So what's next for her? Is she... Locally or down to MD? MD, okay. All right. Very good. That's great news, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, Dawn Stelzer's mom continued to pray for her. I did not. She had a, an appointment yesterday. I did not get an update on that appointment. I'm, I apologize. I will follow up with that as soon as I can. Um, Carrie Burgess, your sister-in-law? Still, still in hospice? Okay. What's that? Right, I understand. Sister Barbara McLean, you got an appointment coming up in March 16th. It's coming up a lot sooner than it was last week. That thing's been out there a long time, so we're praying for you, for sure. Frank and Sandra Migo continue to pray for them as they're looking for an assisted living center. And um, I don't know if you've ever been involved in that process, but it is terrible. Absolutely terrible. Um, I've heard this story a thousand times, but for every family that walks through it, it's new to them. They they got there, and, and it was going to be 4000 a month, and they thought, man, that's a lot, but I think we can swing it. By the time they left, it was $8,000 a month. So, you know, that happens every single time. So, you know, whatever, everything that, that you need added on adds thousands of dollars, and it's just crazy. Uh, so be praying for them. Be praying for wisdom to know where to go, which one to do, and all that. Again, if you've been through that, you fully understand what I'm talking about. Julie, how's your mama? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Goodness. Tommy, you know anything about Helen? I tried to call them yesterday. They didn't, they didn't answer a call back. Haven't heard anything. Okay. All right. Very good. Jean Folks' daughter is doing really well. Um, she's still taking chemo, so keep praying, but she is doing uh, really well. So that's great news. Uh, Noah, we had uh, some news on Noah today. Had a, a, a doctor's appointment this, this morning. Uh, that's why my wife isn't here. She just... Didn't want to answer all the questions, so field the questions my direction if you don't mind. But uh, he, uh, he, 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 they told us what we knew was coming. But when you hear it from the doctor, it gets a little worse. So he, uh, he, he, he's at 24 percent of his kidney function currently. So when he, when he gets down to 20 percent, they'll put him back on the kidney transplant list. Um, so if you, just very quickly, if you don't know, uh, he had a kidney transplant from his mom in 2003, kidney transplant from me in 2010. Um, and so we no longer have a kidney to donate. Um, and so uh, we're praying about that. I'm not concerned about where the kidney's going to come from. That doesn't concern me at all. Um, truly, it, it honestly doesn't bother me. Um, but they, they suspect in about six months, uh, less than six months, he'll be on the transplant list. Less than a year, we'll have to either transplant or look at um, some other option. So uh, dialysis or something. But the last, uh, tw the last two times, he was not... Um, able to do dialysis, so that may may not be and probably is not a solution. So, uh, be praying for that. Uh, we again, I'm not I'm not concerned about where the kidney will come from. That concerns me zero. Uh, but if you've ever been around somebody with uh, renal failure, it gets worse before it gets better. So he's already sleeping a lot. He's at 24 percent. So they'll wait until he gets to 20 percent before they ever put you on a list, and then you get down to about 10 percent before they actually do anything. Right, so. David, is yeah. He, he's okay. Yeah, he's at home. He's at home. Yep, he's at home. So, How's he doing? Is he doing better? Or? Uh, he's, you know, he's about the same. Blood pressure is still really high. Uh, his blood pressure so this morning down? was 170 over 110. What? Did you run it down? No, no, not yet. So, it is the kidney failure. Yeah, yeah. So that is the big thing. Yeah, so that's, uh, I'm glad I mentioned that. So that's specifically what we need to be praying for is the blood pressure would drop. So that's that's the kind of the big thing right now is blood pressure is high and, and no medication is bringing it down. So, um, yeah, if you could pray for his blood pressure, that would probably be the, the best thing to pray for. Um, I haven't gotten an update on Monty Smith in a while, and since you're the only Hassan I'm staring at, Bethany, you have anything? Okay. 
Now, is she still doing chemo, or was he ever? Okay. Okay. Mike Freeman, your, uh, your family member, Robin, <coughs> Scarberry, bone cancer? Okay. So chemo or... or Very good. We'll continue to pray for that. Now, is is is, is Robin local? Is she here? Or? Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, let me think here. See if I have any other ones. Glenda's uh, cardiologist appointment on Monday went well. Yep. You got anything else coming up I need to put on this thing? Uh, Okay. Watch it if you're if you're the popped up type of cancer is doing good and I'm free of cancer and good. Want to keep me eye on every little thing, not on the leg and everything. So <laughs> that one thing together. I understand. Be praying for uh, James and Barbara. They have had an inundation of of losses in their family. Uh, uh, four is it? Is this number four now? Or just three? I apologize. I'm I'm adding one for you. Yeah. So. Yeah, you don't need another one. So uh, be praying for them. You know that that gets uh, it gets daunting and heavy. So be praying for them. Any other ones? I brought. I have one. Uh, I have a new little cousin. Lived about two days, and she weighed two pounds when she was born. I put her on oxygen. She was doing real good. We walk in there. She quit breathing. I took her to Children's Hospital. Put her in intensive care. I'm sorry. What was what was uh, the the baby? Well, name? What's the baby's uh, name? I would I would say um, the cousin by my, my dad's side. It would be Jones. Mm -hmm. It'd be Robert Jones. All right. Baby. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the truth, brother. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right, you just blew some people's minds, probably. Yeah. Goodness. Just get it. Okay. Okay. Now are they are they local as well or? Yeah. Okay. Jim and Christine Poole? Friday, would Noah ever be normal? Nope. No? No, but that's all right, I'm not normal. Not either. Grow big and tall? Nope. Nope. Never will. Tom Burks. That's all right. He gets that from me. What uh, any other new ones? Sister Jimmy. Okay. What's going on with Brother Mike? Really? So just not getting over from the COVID. Okay.
Any, anybody else have any? Singing church women tomorrow, 7 o'clock, IBC. All right. Okay. Sarah, you got it. Where's that? Uh, there will be some some updates on that at our business meeting this Sunday night. So thank you for bringing that up, Jim. It would be a, if you don't normally attend business meetings, this Sunday night would be a, a good one for you to attend. Steve. Yes. Thank you, brother. Sister Cheryl is, has a bad cough and just not feeling well, and she's had it for a week now. So be praying, be praying for her. They gave her cough medicine in the form of a pill. Never heard of that. Uh, it's yeah. just like that. I've had it before. It's a safety amount. Huh? Is she eating all the pearls in the house? You're the only pearl. Huh. Never heard of one. All right. Anybody else? Awesome. There's a lot. There's a lot going on. A lot going on in our church. A lot going on in our, our families. And uh, a lot going on in our world. Let me pray for us uh, really quickly. And then we're going to dive into 2 Samuel chapter 8 this evening. Father, we do uh, come to you tonight, first and foremost, praising you for being our God. God, that we are able to come to you to lift these up in prayer, to set these before your feet, to know that you are a God who hears, a God who has a, a plan for these. And Father, we just rest in your will in each and every one of them. And Father, that, that we may have our wills aligned uh, with yours. And God, that we may have your heart for these situations. I thank you for each and every one uh, that is here tonight, uh, that is here tonight here in the adults, over in the youth and downstairs in the children's. God, I just ask that you be with each and every one, that your spirit would be poured out on, on this place. God, that people will not be able to leave here without knowing that they have met you in this place, that you are a God, you are a living God, and you are our living hope. And we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for all that you're going to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so 2 Samuel chapter 8. Here's what we got. What time is it? Oh, yeah, we've got plenty of time. So chapter 8 is, uh, is, is, is a killing chapter, all right? We're going to get in a little bit of livestock, which is always fun and exciting for you because that's when you get to make fun of me, all right? So we're going to talk about that tonight. So here we go. A uh, bunch of killing going on here, a lot of war. Uh, turn with me to chapter 7, verse 1, before we get started. Before we get into 8, 1, let's get into 7, 1. 7, 1 says, Now it came about when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest on every side from all his enemies, uh, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells with a tent uh, with, within tent curtains, and, and you know the rest of that chapter. But, but here he is in, in chapter 7, verse 1, saying that the Lord has given him rest on every side. And now we turn to chapter 8, and we see all of these battles, all right? So most scholars believe that chapter 8 actually precedes chapter 7. And so for, for the reason of which I've just showed you. Um, to me, it doesn't, it doesn't really bother me either way, but probably chapter 8 did Proceed chapter 7, uh, chronologically speaking. Here we go, uh, verse 1 and whopping 2. Uh, it says, Now after this, 
It came about that David defeated the Philistines, subdued them, and came. Uh, and David took control of the chief city from the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab and measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. And he measured two lines to put them to death and one full line to keep alive. And the Moabites became servants to David, bringing tribute. Okay, so again, uh, whether this comes before chapter 7 or not, that really doesn't change anything of what we talk about. But what we have is, is David obviously going into battle. He, he will defeat enemies literally on every side uh, of him. And, and so we start off that he, that he defeats the Philistines. Well, this is a, a battle that he has been uh, battling for quite some time, right? You guys remember all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 5, he is warring with the Philistines, all right? If you remember, though, he wasn't always at war with the Philistines. You remember 1 Samuel, uh, where he is running and doing this cat and mouse game, Right. And with, with, with Saul, what, 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 what happens? Where, where does he end up going for refuge? Anybody remember? He goes and lives with the Philistines, right? He goes and lives with the Philistines in, in, in 1 Samuel. Um, and so he lives with them. He actually goes on raids for them. And he even goes into battle with them only for about this long. Right, if you remember that whole story. But, uh, but anyways, I, I digress. So he hasn't always been in battle with the Philistines. He actually uh, took harbor with the Philistines. But now he is king, and he goes in, and he defeats the Philistines, and he subdues them. And David took control of the, t uh, the chief city. Now, there are different, uh, I told you, I, I, would, I would be with your NIV, and I, I forgot it on my desk, but I wouldn't bought one. All right, because there's a lot of NIVers in here. And so I bought one and I was looking. And, and there's a lot of different translations for this chief city. But 1 Chronicles chapter 18 tells us that the chief city is Gath. All right. So you're wondering what the chief city was. It was, it was more than likely it was Gath. So he takes control of Gath from the hand of the Philistines. Now, this is huge. This is a huge win for him. Uh, Gath was a, a huge city, uh, but yet... You know, was it a win for David? Absolutely. Did, did David actually conquer him? The answer would probably be no, right? God allowed that to happen. God gave them into the hands of David. We're going to see this over and over and over again. We'll see this primarily in verse 6, but we'll see it at the end of this chapter as well. That, that, that literally, you know, God is going before him and, and, and defeating his enemies for him. He says he defeated Moab in verse 2. Moab... Um, was, was a city that was actually uh, prophesied about in Numbers, Numbers chapter 24. It, it talks about Moab uh, being defeated, and here we go, uh, David is fulfilling that prophecy. Obviously, not David himself, but David, through the power of God, is fulfilling this prophecy, again, in Numbers chapter 24. So he defeats Moab and measures them with the line making them lie down on the ground. He measures two lines, put to death in one full line to keep alive. So imagine this, uh, if, you've, if you've grown up in your homes, and uh, if, do any of you guys have like this wall where you measured all of your children? You put the line on the side, you put their name and the date. Anybody, anybody do that in their house? Well, all right, well, we bought our house. I know uh, the people we bought our house from, I know, and, and some of you guys may know as well. They had that, uh, a wall that had uh, all their names and their dates on it, and I couldn't bring myself to paint over it, so it's actually still there, uh, names that you come over to my house and you probably have no idea who they are. But beside those are my kids as well, right? I get the ladder for Matthew, and I get that. It works out really well. But this, this is something, something that is very similar going on here, um, kind of. Uh, he has them lay on the ground, and he has two different sizes of cords, all right? Now, a couple of different hypotheses, a couple of different ideas of what's going on, but the most favorable is this, is that uh, he measures out uh, two different lengths of cord. If you're, if you're long or as long as the, the short cord, you're fine, but if you're a, as long as the long cord, you're not quite so fine, you get put to death. All right, so that's one theory. Another theory is he puts them in uh, three different piles, basically, and every third pile, they, they get passed over, and the other two piles, he kills all of those people. 
All right? So either way you want to look at it, you didn't want to be one of these guys laying on the ground with the cord measured next to you. Okay? Um, so he was, he was killing most of them, and uh, obviously that's the, that's the whole point of this, is that not only did he defeat Moab, but he, he actually, again, killed most of the prisoners. Now, we, we typically would frown upon that in our day and time, but that's something that they, you know, that was actually pretty common, something that they did back then. So he, he defeated Moab, he, he measured them with the line, and, and then the, the end of that result is he ended up killing off two-thirds of them, all right? Uh, Gerald. Really? Hmm. So what was the point? No, I mean, what was the point of them killing every tenth one, do you know? Yeah, it's kind of weird. It's really weird. I don't know. I don't know. So uh, here, the, the, the most scholars will say the reason that he killed off two-thirds was, well, mainly the reason he kept a third was in order that they would, at the end of verse 2, what did they do? The Moabites became servants, servants to David, and they brought an annual tribute to him. All right? So that's the reason why he kept some alive, in order that they could plow the fields and do the things there in Moab, and they would bring him an annual tribute, all right? So there, that's the whole rationale there, um, which, you know, I mean, makes perfect sense to me. Well, Who am David I? Still king? David was still king. That is absolutely right. Verse 3, then David defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his rule at the river. Now, Verse 3 is an interesting passage, all right? Verse 3, we can read it, and we can move on, and we would probably never give it another thought. The problem is uh, we're wondering what is this rule at the river, and why did he need to restore it, all right? Because we, we started off by uh, he is defeating everyone, he is conquering everyone, everything is going in his way. And then we have this verse 3 uh, that says uh, he came to restore his rule at the river. Well, we've never seen anywhere where he has lost his rule, right? Everybody's okay with that? We haven't seen that. And so we wonder, well, what's going on here? Well, Psalm chapter 60, or Psalm, yeah, Psalm 60 will actually clear it up very well for you. If you wanted to turn there, I will turn there with you. Psalm 60 will help us. Uh, I don't know that it uh, answers every single question that you may have, but Psalm 60 does help us in this, with this verse. He says, uh, for the choir director, oh, uh, lament over defeat in battle and prayer for help. All right, for the choir director according to Shushan. All right, so he says this at the end of that, very uh, up there at the top, Aram Zobah, right, and Joab returned and smote 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of the Salt. So turn with me back to 2 Samuel chapter 8 in verse 13. It gets even better. Anybody confused yet? Because if you're not, here we go. I'm going to make you confused. 2 Samuel chapter 13. So David, or I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 13. So David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000. And then what does your Bible say? Edomites? Arameans? Syrians? Isn't this great? Isn't this fun? So we have three different names. We had Edomites. We have Syrians, and we have uh, Arameans. And what version is yours, brother? NIV. That's what I thought it was. Thank you. Sister Catherine, what's your version? King James. Thank you, sister. All right. So anybody got anything different? Again, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 13. David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000. Anybody got anything? Arameans? How many? Most, most of you have Arameans? Some have Edomites. Oh, postscript. Postscript. It's a really long word. All right. Very good. So let's finish this verse, and then I'll come back because I'm almost done. Uh, Arameans or, or Edomites or whatever you got. Um, in the Valley of Salt. 
Here's the problem. Arameans weren't in the Valley of Salt, all right? They were there. So we have a problem, although we don't really have a problem. Um, 1 Chronicles chapter 18 clears it up perfectly for us. It was NIV fans. Huh? NIV fans, let me see you. You got it right, all right? It was Edomites, okay? It was the Edomites. Um, and so Psalm 60 clears that up for us. 1 Chronicles clears that up for us. Um, the whole battle here in verse 3 is they were defeated, um, and then they come back and they, they regain that, all right? Psalm 60, go read it, go study it on your own. We, we won't spend any more time on that. But uh, verse 3 and verse 13 are all talking about the Edomites, all right? So he goes up, restores his rule at the river. Verse 4, David captured from him 1,700 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers, and David hamstrung the chariot horses, but reserved enough of them for 100 chariots. Okay, here we go. So uh, we know that the, we're talking about Edomites. We know we're talking about the land of Edom, and we'll talk more about that as we go through chapter 8. But what we do know for sure is he captures from them 1,700 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers, and uh, these, these, uh, these, hor- these horsemen, uh, or, or, the idea, or these, these horse, these horses, what he does to them is he hamstrings the chariot horses. So the horses, obviously, were trained to pull a chariot. All right, everybody, that's, even I figured that one out, right? And I don't do livestock, as you guys know, all right? So don't worry, I looked up lots of pictures on hamstringing a horse. I never we didn't actually physically ham. I'm just talking like a, y'all are gross. I'm not talking like that. I'm just talking like, where's the hamstring on a horse? I didn't know this. Y'all know this. Go ahead. Where's the hamstring on a horse? On, on the back of the leg, right? On the back of the leg. And what they would do is they would cut or sever the hamstring on the back of the leg, all right? One side or the other, not usually both sides, although they could if they wanted to, but usually just one side or the other. What this does is it lames the horse enough to where it can never be used in battle again, although eventually it will heal enough to where it can be used as, you know, whatever it is you want to use a lame horse for. I don't know, right? So the idea is they would take them out of commission, not being able to be used against them uh, in battle down the road. Now, let me ask you this. What use does David have in the city of chariots? The answer would be he has zero use for chariots. Chariots are, are good for flat ground, right? They're good for the, the desert. They're good for uh, anywhere but where David was, anywhere but where the Israelites were. And so uh, he had no use for these chariots. So he, he ends up hamstringing all of these horses uh, except for 100 chariots. So then we see in verse 5, when the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezar, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 Arameans. Then David, in verse 6, put garrisons among the Arameans of Damascus. And the Arameans became servants to David, bringing, what's that word again? Tribute. That is an annual tribute that they would bring to David. All right? I'm trying my best to get to verse 11. Um, We're going to try really hard to get there. Um, So they put up these garrisons. All right? So these garrisons would be a great thing. Um, In the end of verse 6, and the Lord helped David wherever he went. That's the important part that we see uh, out of this chapter. That's one of them. There'll be another one, but we won't get there tonight. We'll get there next week. But verse 6 is that, again, that the Lord helped David wherever he went. All all of these defeats were not because David was a stellar guy. David was the best in combat, although he was great. All of this is because of God, right? All good things come from God, right? We, We know that to be true. We know that from Scripture. And so... It reminds us here in verse 6, this isn't, uh, this isn't David charming his way to defeat all these people. This is the act of God Almighty doing what he said he would do, right, which is giving peace amongst his enemies. We'll see that uh, later as we walk through Second Samuel. All right, so uh, David, uh, so I'm talking about garrisons. Garrisons. He put the garrisons up in, in order that he would allow uh, a couple of things. One is that he would bring safety to Damascus in order that no one else would overtake them so that they would bring their annual tribute to uh, David and and the city. Um, And then the other thing was they would charge for safe passage. They would charge for safe passage. And you say, safe passage to where? To where? Well, I can't tell you that yet because we're not there yet. 
So, verse 7. David took the shields of gold, which were carried by the servants of Hadadezar, and brought them to Jerusalem. Now, these... Uh, the only thing you really need to know about these shields of gold, you can know anything you want, but these shields of gold were not actually used for battle. They, they were more of an of a, of a ornamental type of thing, much like what we see with our Marine Corps, and they give them the sword. Right? You guys ever seen that? Right? It's not for battle. It's ornamental. And so uh, that's what these uh, shields of gold would have been for. Um, in verse 8, but uh, from Beta... And from Barothai, cities had a days are King David took a very large amount of bronze. It's important, and it's not quite as important yet, but remind me verse 8 when we get to verse 11, or 10, actually. No, it's 11. Remind me to go back to 8 when we hit 11. Here we go. Now when Ty, uh, Ty uh, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadazar, Ty sent uh, Jerome, or uh, Joram, his son, uh, to King David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hedadazar and defeated him. For Hedadazar had been at war with Ty and Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. Here we go, we finally made it. Everybody understands that? He defeated an enemy uh, of, a, of an enemy <laughs> and that enemy comes and he makes friends with David. He says, hey, we had, a, we had an enemy together. You've defeated him. Let you and I be friends. Everybody's okay with that? Everybody understands that? All right, great. So verse 11, King David also dedicated these to the Lord. Those are the things that was given to him by Ty, right, for, um, for um, defeating uh, the army of Hedadazar. So he, he dedicated these to the Lord with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. So all the plundering of all the places that they had, had, had conquered, they took all the gold, all the silver, all of these wonderful things, and what did he do with it? He, he gave it to the Lord, right? He gave it to the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy says, Deuteronomy 17, I believe, don't quote me on that or throw things at me if it's not it, but I'm pretty certain it's Deuteronomy 17, says that kings are not to build up for themselves many horses or silver and gold, all right? Remember, I, I have to say this every single week, remember, David is a king that abides by the Torah, right? The law, okay? That's what he's known for. And Deuteronomy 17, again, tells him that he's not to be uh, gaining a lot of horses or a lot of silver and gold, all right? So he, he takes all of this stuff, he dedicates it to the Lord, puts it in a, in a safe place so that Solomon can do what with it? Build the temple, okay, all right, fine. He does take the bronze from verse 8 to build the temple, all right? I'll give you that. Now, what else does he do? Yes. Yes, that's true. What do we know about Solomon? Richest man ever, and what did he do? Ask for wisdom, but after what? After he was king, absolutely. But after he squandered most of his life away. Right? Well, we see that he had done all kinds of things. We'll look at this next week. As a matter of fact, remind me. We're going to start with Solomon. All of these treasures that King David had with, with the heart that he had. By the way, he had the right heart. All right? He said, I'm not going to have all of these, all of these uh, jewels for myself. I'm going to give those to the Lord. So he left what's called, what m many of you guys know as an inheritance, to Solomon. Solomon takes it, and he uses it in a way that is not glorifying to God, all right? So, inheritance is not always a great thing, and we're going to look at that. I'm just going to start with that next week. Right, we're going we're gonna to jump ship way off of 2 Samuel, because I, I think it's very important to see how these things correlate with one another. We have a godly king, for the most part, all right, we're going to see where he fails, and everybody remembers that. Right? But for the most part, we have a very godly king who adheres to the Torah. He does what is right. He has a heart for God, right? But then he leaves all of this stuff to his son and doesn't do a very good job there. And we'll talk about that next week. And unfortunately, we are completely out of time. So um, anybody got any quick word? You may be completely confused, but I promise it's all going to be summed up next week. Yeah, 
and, and there's, there's a lot of truth to that. There, there really is a lot of truth to that. Because, again, what we see here is it was squandered. It was actually used against God, right? Most of it. Now, again, verse 8, uh, the bronze here was used for the temple. And, and, and some of these were. But. What's wrong with having inheritance? Well, just how you use your inheritance is what matters. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, in Deuteronomy 17. Oh, okay. Wonderful. All right. Great. All right. Last thing, I promise we're so out of time, but I, I think this is important. Anybody, uh, uh, First Chronicles, I don't have time to ask this question. I'm just going to answer it for you. First Chronicles chapter 22. Go back, see how much gold and how much silver. How much gold, how much silver. We're talking um, seven and a half million pounds of gold. Seven and a half million pounds of gold. Anybody want to guess how many million pounds of silver? I'll let you figure it out. It's over 50 million pounds of silver, by the way. We're talking a lot, okay? <laughs> this is a lot, all right? Anyways, all right, we'll get into that later. It's crazy. All right, let me, let me close this in prayer. Father, I do thank you for your word. Uh, God, I ask that you would bring us back next week. Uh, may we see and continue to see from your word what we are to glean from it, how are we to live our lives knowing what we have read tonight? And God, I pray that, that you would be glorified in it, that we would, we would not just come on Wednesday night and, and be fed, but we would leave this place with more questions and we would go home and we would dissect them for ourselves. Father, we thank you for being in this place tonight. We thank you for all of those that are on, on our prayer list, that we're able to, to intercede for them. Father, I pray that that you would bring these into our minds, that we would continue as we walk through our busy, busy lives. May we bring these before your throne. What a privilege it is to offer these up to you. And God, we thank you. We thank you for your great compassion upon us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here tonight. See you next week.